people who are walking in darkness have seen a great light. I tell you, it takes a while sometimes to get the light to come up. How you all doing? Oh, I'm so glad to see all of you. I really am. I'm sorry there's no food today. That's just the way it goes sometimes. But we are in the second week of Forward as we work to re begin the ministry here of D.C. Church. We started last week with uh, the grand reopening. And now we have, now we, we never closed, okay, except for a few weeks at the very beginning of the virus. But this is sort of symbolic of our returning to our full ministry. And you saw a big part of our ministry today in children's ministry. We have a lot of children, a lot of preschoolers, and they are so important to us. Well, anyway, it's great to have you here. Now, in two weeks, Forward will end with a great commitment Sunday, and part of that commitment Sunday is a big offering. We haven't had a special offering for our church's ministry for over two years, so it's been a while. But what we hope to do is make up a little tiny bit. It won't be, a, be the whole thing, only be a, maybe less than 10% of all the monies that we've missed the last two years as, as the virus has, uh, has hurt our church, not just our church, but all kinds of ministries and other organizations in our country. So we're going to have a big offering, and, I, and my wife and I, we're going to give, and I hope you'll give too. Our goal is $80,000 total. So what the thinking is that we normally give uh, $30,000, $33,000, sometimes a little bit more on a Sunday. And we're going to just count on that coming in. And then above that, $50,000. So you give a special gift of some kind to help make up your gift. And $80,000 total. Understand? Hey, an offering envelope is coming to you, okay? But if you don't want to give, you don't have to give. There's no, uh, no expectation. And then next Sunday is the Sunday of the Ages. Like that? Sounds very impressive, doesn't it? In other words, we are uh, emphasizing some of our age group ministries next Sunday. Senior adult ministry at the traditional service, that's at 930. And then youth ministry at this service, that's next Sunday. And uh, I'll be speaking about what the scripture says about how God can use people no matter what age they are. That's really cool. Today we're looking at uh, a, a variety of verses from Genesis as we're talking about the family, and I recommend you not turn to Scripture. Just follow along on one of the screens because it's the different Scriptures from different parts of Genesis and also from Matthew's Gospel. It'll be easier for you. So here we are in Genesis chapter 1, also Genesis chapter 2, and then I'll read from Matthew 19. This is what Genesis says. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 2. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is the first love poem. Thank you very much for responding. That's great. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now we read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. Now the purpose here is, I won't be commenting on, upon this in, in, directly, is that Jesus knew about the teaching in Genesis, and the Savior endorsed it. Of course he would. I mean, he's God in the flesh, but... When a person or someone who doesn't agree with the teaching of Genesis not only has a problem with God, but they have a problem with the Savior as well. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God is joined together, let no man separate. Man, woman, children, family are all things that God has done. They are His truth. And so what, uh, what we're going to do today is just very clearly lay out, just simply and clearly lay out what Scripture says about men and women, about children, about, about family, about the home. And I don't want to treat the Bible as an instruction book or a manual. It's much, much more than that. But, you know, we need to read the instructions once in a while. A, 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 a wife bought her husband a wonderful, expensive Christmas gift on Amazon. 
and she wanted to hide the gift from him, so she wanted to hide the receipt and the invoice. And so she came up with the idea that she would create a new folder on her computer and put the, the file in there, and she named it Manual. Because, <laughs> you know, we men, we don't need no stinking instructions. I guess sometimes women don't need instructions either. It's a human problem. So we don't want to treat the Bible as an instruction manual, but sometimes it does give us the why and the how of what God's plan is. And by reading Scripture and reading what Scripture says about God's mind, about His plan, we can discover so much about who we are and what God wishes for us to do. And so the word Genesis means the beginning. And so what we have in Genesis is God creating the universe and having in that creation a plan for us for who we are. And so he made man. He made man male and female so that we are only fully man, fully human when we come together as male and female. The idea of gender is God's idea. There's something called maleness, is something called femaleness. And those two concepts mean something. And then let me say it again, God intends for human beings to be together, male and female. So we become fully and most completely who we are when we come together inside of the sexual union. We become mankind. And then he says, now you be fruitful and multiply. That is, you have children. Fill the earth with children. Now, um, I know that some couples can't have children. And you may know about the struggles of my family, what our family's gone through. And so I don't want to go through it again. I understand that some can, and, I, and, I, and in no way do I want to, to make someone feel uncomfortable to hurt them. Or maybe, maybe you decide as a married couple not to have children. And what you decide is, is your own business. None of my business. I'm simply trying to lay out what Scripture teaches that God intends for us to have children and to fill the earth. Now, one of the signs of a sick and dying culture is when we don't have children. And there are some European countries now, not just European countries, Russia's paying couples to have children. Italy is, is not having children at the rate needed to replace. And so uh, countries like Russia and, and Italy or not have enough to replace. Even in America, the average family now has about 1.7 children, which is less than the replacement rate. It's a sign that our culture is dying when it doesn't have children. God said, you be fruitful and multiply, and you fill the earth. That's God's intention. Now, the trouble is that these things that I just simply stated to you, that we don't believe them any longer. Now, I'm not talking about you. You may or may not believe them. I think you probably do. But in general, in our culture, we don't believe them. I was reading the other day, a very famous comedian. You would know him if I mentioned his name. It's not my job to mention names. He may be watching. He will sue me. And, and you know him because he was married to a very famous singer at one time. And, now, and also, he's done a lot of reality TV shows. He was the MC. But he has had, in the last year... Three children by three different women. And there's no shame or embarrassment in that. And all these women know about each other and know about the other children, which is just, to me, an amazing thing. And for some reason, we think that people, because they're famous, know more about how to be married or have relations with male or female better than what God's Word says. Isn't it strange that we're like that? You see, the trouble is we don't believe it any longer. We don't practice it in our culture. The other day, my wife and I were driving through the, uh, the Starbucks um, drive through line, and we got to the front. I, we, I had ordered a, a caffeinated coffee for me and a decaf for my wife, and I got to the, to the front, the young lady behind the counter. She handed me our coffees, and I looked at, the, at them to make sure that they were right. I said, I'm checking because if my wife drank caffeine, she'd be up until Saturday. And the girl behind the counter looked at us and said, you all are so cute. <laughs> See, there's three stages of cuteness in a relationship. The first stage is when you're 16 
and you're dating in high school and it's puppy love, right? The, the, the second stage is when you're pushing 70, you know, and you're still together, right? It's cute. And the third stage is when you're in the nursing home and you keep your false teeth in the same glass. You know, that's when it's all so cute, you know. I'm just thinking about the future. That's all I'm doing right now. <laughs> she said, you're so cute. You're so adorable. How long have you been married? I said, 47 years. 47 years. And you still like each other? <laughs> like that was the biggest shock in all the world. That we still liked each other. Well, yeah, we still like each other. It's possible to fall in love, be married for 47 years, have children, and be happy. Yes. It's possible. That's the problem, though, that in our culture we just don't believe it. I was um, listening to a, a commentator uh, talking to a famous pastor, and the commentator is kind of a middle-of-the-road guy. He doesn't either left or right. He's kind of middle-of-the-road. And this pastor was talking to this very famous pastor. His church has more than 100,000 attending in locations all over the world. And he was pushing about homosexuality, which is one of the things that, that, that's challenging the church. And, and, the, and, and the idea was that the pastor was believing or teaching homosexuality is a sin and not part of God's plan. Now, I know about his church. He has uh, several thousand gay people who attend his church because they want to worship and they want to hear the truth. And, and they're accepted, they're loved, as in any church that really loves the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this, 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 this commentator was pushing him because he couldn't believe that this is what somebody was believing and teaching in this time. And the, the pastor says simply, what's well, what the Bible teaches? And the commentator says something which I think is one of those most stupid things that any smart person has ever said. What we need is a new Bible. And we're going to forget the idea of inspiration for a moment that the Bible is inspired. We need a new Bible. We need to put some smart men in a room and come up with a new scripture. Well, you know, the teachings I'm talking about right now have been blessing mankind for 6,000 years. Our Jewish friends have been together as a people and are the most successful people the world has ever known because they have believed these words. Now, me personally, I'm just giving you my own testimony. I'll stick with the Bible I've got. And so what I'm simply doing is affirming that the idea of man and woman and children and family are from the beginning. They're God's plan. Now, the greatest thing God ever created was marriage. The greatest thing. He saw that the man was alone. And he was lonely because he was alone. That's what happens when you're alone, you're lonely. And so he made a helper for him, stand beside of him. Now, he didn't take the woman from his head to be above him, didn't take him from his feet. This is the old thing that was said years ago. To be below him, he took the woman out of his side that she would stand beside him, equal with different gifts and abilities, qualities, but equal. And his, his, God's desire was that, 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 that this is woman... She will stand beside you and be your equal and your helper and your friend and you will have companionship and you will come together and in the sexual union act out your oneness and your happiness and your peace. And Adam liked what God had done. He said, God, you did a good job. She's woman. She's flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. She's part of me and I am part of her. This uh, little kid went to Sunday school. And while I was at Sunday school that day, they were studying this uh, passage in, in uh, Genesis about Adam and Eve. And so he went home and his mother fixed him lunch for you know, Sunday lunch. And after lunch, was always, he had a really bad pain in his side. He said, Mom, I have a bad pain in my side. I think I'm having a woman. <laughs> well, that's what God did. And so you see, it was God's plan for men and women to come together and be married. But his, his greatest creation? How about light? 
How about whales? How about the Atlanta Braves? It's great as creation. Yes, because, you see, humankind is the pinnacle, the top of what he's done. And the top of what he's done, he's made human beings male and female and meant for them to come together in marriage to produce children, to populate the earth. This was the center of his plan. It's what God wanted. And so his plan from the very beginning was that we are fully human and the happiest when we come together in marriage. Now I'll just give you my own testimony that um, I didn't really discover myself and discover who I am until I got married. And just like the scripture says in Proverbs chapter 27, iron sharp sharpens iron. When I became married, my wife began to show me who I was and what I was about, and, and she helped me to grow. And in our case, it's really uh, a, a tungsten carbide file sharpens iron. That's what my wife is. <laughs> okay. And so I really became who I am and what I am because I got married. This is how God has worked. This is what God's plan is. And, and then, then, you know, the, the whole idea behind sexuality is that we act out our oneness through our sexual relations. And there's this idea, as I talked about this celebrity a while ago who has had in the last year three children with three different women. It's the idea that you can't be happy sexually with just one partner. Now, that's not what the studies show. Isn't this interesting? The studies show exactly what Scripture teaches. Isn't that strange? That people are happier sexually are people who are committed to each other for life and discover the joy of expressing their love for each other through being together sexually. And so it was God's plan from the very beginning that men and women come together and be married. And be happy. I have done a lot of weddings. A lot of weddings. And I enjoy doing them. Now, I don't get a chance to stand with the women before the wedding. That's somebody else. I'm with the, with the groom and all of his groomsmen. And usually if we have it here, we have it, I, I stand out here on the side. And I'm with the, the groom and the groomsmen for, for a long time, you know. 20, 30, 40 minutes. <laughs> Depends on when the wedding starts. Sometimes the wedding starts 15, 20 minutes late. So I'm at the and I listen to him talking. And so the, one of the goons will come up and say, Hey, it's your last chance. I got a car out by the door, it's the engine's running. We can get you in there. We'll be out of the parking lot before anybody even knows about it. And the funny thing about this is they're only half kidding. I've heard the guys talking together. Are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure? One woman for the rest of your life? I know you. Are you sure you want to do this? Isn't it funny how we think? But the truth of the matter is that the greatest thing God ever created was marriage. And inside of marriage, we discover who we are. We express our sexuality and we discover our true happiness. And one last thing here. Family is God's plan for raising children. Amen. A man and a woman joining together in marriage, having children, being fruitful, multiplying, and, and raising those kids. Now, I, I say this with all respect for single parents because they have to be both mom and dad for their, for their kids, and I, and I do respect that. But just simply to say that with a man teaching the children what maleness is and whether they're boys or girls, and the, and the woman teaching the children, boys and girls, what femaleness is, helps to replicate those ideas into the future when they are also grown and married and having children. And, and so kids need to have that in their lives, male and female together raising kids. That's God's plan. And it's a good thing to have Men and women getting married and having a home and a picket fence and a dog, you know, and raising kids together. Or a cat. That's me. It's a good thing. 
And what happens is that, that kids grow up the happiest and, 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 the, and the, 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 the most stable when they're raised in a family like that. Now, you may have heard a lot about privilege these days. Well, there's been studies done about this as well. And what, what is privilege is when people wait to get married until they're mature and stable. And then inside of marriage, they have children. They pass on their faith to their children. I'm going to say more about that in a moment. They, 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 they give their children a, a you know, financial security. Those kids themselves go through school and get their college degree, if possible. They go out and they also have a job. And what, what they found out that, the, that those who are, who, who are privileged or successful, who just do things that way. doesn't matter where you come from. doesn't matter your background. What matters is that you, that, that you have a stable home with loved kids who get an education and then take a job. And those people do the best. Isn't that strange? Well, not really. It's always been God's plan for the family. Now, I know personally myself, my own testimony, God gave me several different things to do in my life. And one, one thing he gave me to do was be a dad. I enjoyed being a dad so very much. I had two sons, both part of our church. One of, our sons is past, one of my sons is pastor at um, the other campus, the West Portsmouth campus. And boy, I had a lot of fun raising them. I can't tell you how many bullpens we did. It must have been hundreds. I went to, I think, several thousand baseball games. I know one summer we had 156 baseball games. My two sons at that time were playing on two different teams, on two different fields. The seals were side by side. So I started a ditch in the middle of them and went watch one while I was watching the other. I was standing in the ditch. Where's the pastor? He's out standing in the ditch. And, and, and we went to Disney World many, many, almost every summer and we had so many memories. And I've played golf with them so many times and I have so much fun with them. It's a blessing. And now they've got kids. I've got grandkids. I went from zero to five grandkids like that, you know, just like that over a five-year period, like, like that. And now I get a chance to see them raise their children. I mean, Josh and Sarah and Cal and Sterling, that's their kids. But as granddad, I get a chance to watch and be a part of it. And I really enjoy that. You know, yesterday, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me back up a little bit. Josh, my oldest son, had an imaginary friend named Frederick who lived in North Carolina. And he talked about his imaginary friend all the time. I miss all the time. <laughs> and now Abigail, my three-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter, has an imaginary family. She has three sisters and ten brothers. <laughs> and she talks about them all the time. Now, you know, Sarah's had a, a baby, uh, Gabriel just had a baby just like four, three weeks ago. After she was in intensive care for 22 days and hospital for six weeks with COVID. And, then she, and she's pregnant the whole time. Then she has the baby. So anyway, I, she, so yesterday I went to soccer games. Abigail's telling me, I've got three sisters and ten brothers. I said, are you counting Gabriel as one of your brothers? And she stopped for a moment. She goes, I have 11 brothers. <laughs> I laughed and laughed and laughed. Isn't it fun having kids? Isn't it fun? And so when, 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 when you, you, you miss out that great blessing of having children, to raise them, and you're, you're missing out on so much fun. Plus, there's one more thing, that, that not only are we populating the earth, but our faith, our faith in Jesus continues through our families. So much of Scripture's teaching about family is, is aimed at our raising our kids knowing Jesus. The Shema in the Old Testament, that's the slogan of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And you talk about it when you're walking along the road. And you talk about it at home and you teach it to your children so your children will know as they grow up, Hear, O Lord, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. You pass our faith on to our children. And one of the great Heartaches for me is to see our kids come through the preschool and children's ministries of our church and, of our, and our youth ministry of our church. And then when the time comes to the graduate, we don't see them ever again. We are failing some way 
and pass that faith on to our children. God's plan for the raising of children is family. Not just to populate the earth, but also to continue our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm just trying to very simply to lay out what your scripture, what your word teaches. That male and female and, and children and the family are all great things that you have created. And that we have found our, our, our purpose, our destiny, our greatest happiness when we're married, have children, have a family and a home. And not only do we continue the human race, but we also have an opportunity to pass on our faith. I pray, Lord, that today that we will hear these teachings, and even though they're difficult in a very difficult world to follow, and we don't judge anyone, we not everyone, we love everyone, we welcome everyone. We're not trying to 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 to, to, to exclude any person. We're simply trying to open up your truth that we can be blessed by it. So, Father, today we reaffirm our belief in these things taught in your word. Now, the first step for someone who is uh, troubled or has difficulty in marriage or in the home is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And I pray right now there might be people watching here at the West Portsmouth campus watching people who are watching online who want to believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord. I pray that, that if they do, that they'll pray this prayer with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. Will you forgive me based on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross and come and live inside my heart by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And I pray this in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer with me, you're now a believer. You're now my brother or sister in, in Christ. And I pray that you'll let me know, let us know about your decision with the, the card you find there in the, in the chair, either here at West Portsmouth or talk to our, our online counselor, share with them about your decision. And we'll share with you more what it means to be a believer and how to fall through in your faith. Now, Father, let me say one more time in our prayer together that we reaffirm our belief in these simple truths about marriage, family, and the home. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.